Good morning, everybody. There's just nine days to go in this general election campaign. Tell me, what do you think of it so far? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Honestly, I, you know, I read the press reports. They tell me how gripped everybody is by the election campaign. My experience is, I don't think that trust, and boy, isn't that an important word, I don't think that trust in our politics, our politicians, or our institutions has ever in our history been lower than it is today. I think people are very turned off. They don't believe a word that's being said. You know, when they're being offered free things. I mean, with Corbyn, it'll be free iPhones next, won't it? You know. But, but we're so used now, aren't we? And election after election to a series of promises being made in manifestos that they, they, they didn't even intend to carry out. They just say it because they think that's what people want to hear. So I don't think this campaign has actually taken off and sparked in any way at all. I think a lot of people out there are, are so disconsolate about the whole political situation that they may well not turn out to vote. Now, this might be to our advantage, because the one party whose voters are the least enthusiastic is a certain Labour Party. Now, the Labour Party have been able to take this part of England for granted pretty much since the First World War. These constituencies for the last 90, 100 years have just returned Labour MPs. There's frankly never even been a contest. And that's because the Labour Party have been seen to be the ones on the side of ordinary people against big institutions, against multinational businesses. You know, they've been seen to be on the side of ordinary folk. And yet I think one of the problems Labour has is that it's now run by a group of left-wing North London intellectuals nearly all of whom come from privilege and have got no connection with ordinary people whatsoever. I mean, they even think that if you dare to believe that we should control our borders, that we should restrict the number of people that come into our country, I mean, Diane Abbott thinks... <laughs> You've not heard of her, no? Well, she was a mathematics professor who came into politics. But, but the implication is that you, somehow you're all nasty, knuckle-dragging, racist, awful people for daring to think it. And on the referendum, the Labour Party campaigned hard for us to remain. That's not unusual. The Lib Dems did the same. And, of course, the Conservatives did the same. They all campaigned for us to remain. Indeed, George Osborne told us, if you remember that half a million jobs would go if we dared to vote to leave. David Cameron suggested it could even lead to World War III if we dared to vote to leave. But we did vote to leave, and the response, despite the fact that the Labour Party, during the referendum, after the referendum, and in their 2017 manifesto, they said regardless of their own opinion, they would respect the result of the referendum. And where are we now with the Labour Party? They think that you lot didn't know what you voted for. You are pig ignorant up here, aren't you? You don't understand. They know better in Islington than you do here. So they're going to make you vote again. Isn't that great? They talk about division in the country and they tell us that a second referendum will solve it. I think a second referendum would be disastrous. I think if we're forced to vote again, there'll be millions of people who say, why should we ever take part ever again in any form of election? I think it would lead to even more bitter divisions than we've seen. I think it would be bad for our economy. And if it was a fair question, 
if leave was on the ballot paper, guess what the result would be? We'd win by an even bigger margin. And they still wouldn't accept it. So we in the Brexit Party are taking the fight above all to the Labour Party. They have betrayed the will of five million Labour Leave voters in this country. They have broken their promises. They have lost touch with ordinary people. And they're led by a bloke. Well, I was actually sitting two rows behind him when he first became leader. And it was the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Britain. Battle of Britain Day, 15th of September. And we were all there in St. Paul's Cathedral. And there were, I think, 28 Spitfire and Hurricane pilots who were still alive. That number's down to four now. So this was four or five years ago. 28 of the surviving pilots of the few that were there. It was a big commemorative service about the remarkable deeds. And there we were, weren't they? Remarkable deeds that, 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 that those men carried out against the odds. And I remember when the national anthem played, I saw he wasn't singing it. And that told me, frankly, everything I need to know. You know, not just that he calls terrorist organizations like Hezbollah and Hamas his friends, not just that he was consorting with Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness within months of that appalling bomb in Brighton in 1984, but if the bloke can't even sing the national anthem, he clearly does not believe, frankly, in our country, and he's completely and totally unfit to lead a country with patriotic communities like you. <laughs> none of this, of course, none of this, of course, is to suggest that I think the Conservatives are the whole solution. Far from it. They've had three and a half years, haven't they? Three and a half years to sort this out. Theresa May came to power, and remember her slogan in the, in the 2017 election? Brexit means Brexit. It's pretty much all she said for the whole campaign. Brexit means Brexit. They'd wind her up at the back in the morning and send her out. Brexit means Brexit. And then when we saw her deal, her so-called deal, a new EU treaty, we realised that Brexit meant being half in, half out, and frankly, in the worst of all worlds. So I've got no great love or trust for the Conservative Party on this. And even in the current cabinet, half of them voted Remain. Many of the candidates they picked for this election were Remain voters. The only reason Boris is sounding so tough on Brexit, the only reason Boris is even Prime Minister, is because earlier this year I had simply had enough. Because I believed them in 2016. When they told us they'd respect the will of the people and carry out Brexit after 25 years of campaigning, I thought it was time to have a bit of a break. I might, you know, visit the pub more often, something like that. But I did actually believe they'd carry out Brexit because they promised us they would. And as I watched those couple of years unfold, I felt I had to do something about it. And it was the founding of the Brexit Party, the launching of the Brexit Party, uh, which took place in Coventry on the 12th of April, storming to victory in those European elections just six weeks later, we got rid of the worst Prime Minister this country has ever seen. <laughs> and Boris knows how powerful and potent our message is with the electorate and so effectively we dragged them kicking and screaming to a position where they say we're going to deliver Brexit and I managed just before this campaign to drag him even further because his deal as it is simply isn't good enough but when he said he was going to campaign now for 
a Canada-style trade agreement without political and regulatory alignment, well, that begins to sound more like Brexit. Now, Boris is very good at making promises to all sorts of people. The question with Boris isn't whether people like him. The question with Boris is, do people trust him? You're ahead of me down there. I'll have to watch my step, won't I? Do people trust him? And that is a real issue. Our job, our historic mission in the Brexit party is to make sure that we can establish a bridgehead in the House of Commons that he will be so frightened of that he'll have to keep to his promise. Because my biggest fear is a Conservative majority that did not fear the Brexit party would be able, as they've done in the last three and a half years, to backpedal on those promises, to leave us half in, half out, and in the worst of all worlds. We want a clean break from the institutions of the European Union. We want to be a truly, genuinely self-governing, independent, proud nation. That is what we're fighting for. And in parts of the country like this, in these constituencies that have never voted Conservative, just look at what happened four years ago when I led UKIP. We came second in all of these seats, all right? Just look at what we did in the European elections this year. We got basically nearly 50% of the vote in these constituencies. We can beat Labour in these seats, but we can only do it if Conservative voters in these seats recognise that if they vote Conservative in areas where we're challenging Labour, they will split the Leave vote. They will split our vote, not the other way round, as you'll read in Tory newspapers, they will split our vote. So we've got to, we've got to persuade Conservatives in these counties of Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire, we've got to persuade Conservatives that in the seats where we're the challenger, they must lend us their vote. And if they do that and vote tactically, we will start to win some of these seats. We will establish some very decent men and women, some of whom you've seen already this morning in Westminster. Not people doing it because they're college kids, straight out of Oxford, you know, the, the, the usual drill, straight out of university, into a research office, into the House of Commons. I mean, goodness me. I was on a platform with them all the other night in Manchester on the ITV debate. Did you see it? Yes. It's like being with a bunch of parrots. <laughs> I mean, they've all got their party script. Do you know, on that program, they even had auto cue for their opening statements and their closing statements. They'd already, de they'd already decided what their closing statements were before the two hour debate even began. And they're not in, but most of them, not all, but most of them are not in politics for the right reason. They're in politics for the sake of it being a career. And our people that have stepped forward, put their heads over the parapet, taken a fair bit of abuse for doing so, which I'm personally very pleased about, because it takes some of the load off me. But our people are doing it for the right reasons. Our people are doing it because they believe in the country. Our people are doing it because they believe in democracy. Our people are doing it because they understand that if Brexit is not delivered, this country will never be the same again in the eyes of the world. This is, this is, this great battle to secure our independence, an independence and freedom that should never, ever, in my opinion, have been given away in the first place. This is the defining political battle of our age. And I know something in my heart. I know we're going to win. I know we're going to get Brexit. But without us, we won't get the right Brexit that leaves us free to open ourselves up to our friends around the world. And I'm thinking about the 2.4 billion people that live in the Commonwealth, the 300 million people that live in the USA, 
people that speak the same language as us, people with a shared history and culture with us, people who came and stood beside us twice in the 20th century to help save us. And this is our chance to reach out to a bigger global family, our chance once again to become Great Britain. Thank you. They're all being very nice. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Great. Well, I told you it's on form. So, we've got time for a quick couple of questions. The first one, let's have a nice, light-hearted one. It's something that I'd like to ask you about too, Nigel. This is from Barbara from Rushcliffe. Are you getting enough sleep? <laughs> I, you know, I, this morning was actually quite a luxury because the alarm did not go off until five to four. I, I, Martin said earlier, what, you know, what's he on? And um, I'm going to quote somebody else, actually. Dennis Thatcher was a very, very active, very, very busy guy. He had an even more active and busier wife. But on his 70th birthday, he did a big women's institute yeah. lunch. And someone said to Dennis on his 70th birthday, how is it, Mr. Thatcher, that you're so fit, you're so well, you're so active? You know, what's the secret? And Dennis replied, gin and cigarettes. And I think in my case, I'm not too far behind him. But there we are. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, so now um, a question dear to my own heart. It's always my dad's minor. And we have a, a minor, former minor, minor son on the stage here. So, big question from Richard from Worksop. What is the Brexit party going to do on the theft of the ex-minors' pensions? You better answer that, not me. Right, so I, 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 can, I can start this by saying th this is a big hot potato over in Ashfield, where I'm standing, um, where we have a Conservative candidate who used to be a Labour chief of staff to help get Remainer Gloria De Piero elected, who is fighting for the, the, the pension scheme, uh, except... Um, the truth of the matter is, in 25 years of consecutive Conservative and Labour governments, over £4 billion in dividends from the pension pot has simply been kept and skimmed off by the government. And meanwhile, we hear of situations where, where minors, widows, are getting like 85 pence a week in pensions, which to me seems like an absolute travesty. And I think... Here is one of the ways for a new political party, unencumbered by the mistakes of their political predecessors, to go in there and say, you've got to do something about this. I think this is precisely the kind of topic that the Brexit party could go in and cause a bit of a ruckus about. That's my two pennies worth. Anything to add? <coughs> Just quickly, I think uh, the point to make is that we should go to uh, John Lansbury who uh, had his mortgage paid for uh, by uh, the miners up in the northeast, uh, and he got a big fat payoff uh, when uh, they closed down uh, the situation up there. So I think it's quite simple. We'll simply go and ask him to give the money back. Yeah. Yeah. It... <laughs> it was never his in, in the first place. Uh, and that's what we see with uh, the various uh, politicians around. And, and I was once asked, um, quite simply, what's the difference between the two parties uh, in terms of uh, what they do? Uh, the ones uh, in power and the ones wanting power. Well, the answer is quite simple. One lot of millionaires before they come into politics and the other lot are determined to be millionaires by the time they leave. <laughs> And we will end that and give the miners their money back. Thank you. Good. Do you want to that? Go ahead. Yeah, I've, I've got a bit to say about that as well, because obviously in Bowles over, you know, we're a big mining community or former mining community. And my grandfather um, was also a miner, probably um, killed him in Cannock Chase pits. But, 
Yeah, £4.4 billion pounds have been skimmed off in surpluses from the miners' pension scheme um, since 1994. My uh, incumbent MP has commented this year in the review saying, stop stealing our pensions. Well, my question is, when you were in government for 10 years, what were you doing about it? You know, we need this review doing and we need it to be a fairer resolution to it. So, yeah, for me, I'll be fighting there with my colleagues for the same to get a fair resolution to this pension scheme. Thank you. OK. And we've got time for one final question. And is this a, a question about tactical voting? Julie from Corby says, we don't trust Boris. So who should we vote for in the Tory Southern seats? Well, this is a difficult one. And it's a very difficult one. Um, I decided not to stand against the existing Conservatives. If Boris had stuck to the deal, as he called it, I'd have stood against him in every seat. When he shifted his position to say he'd go for a free trade deal without political and regulatory alignment, I thought, you know what? It would look slightly mad in the south of England to stand against him if he's saying the same thing as us, even if he doesn't mean it. And secondly, in the south and the southwest, most of our vote comes from the Conservatives. And I think from Dominic Raab's seat in Surrey, right down to the middle of Hampshire, all the way down to Land's End, I think if we and the Conservatives had stood against each other, you'd have seen at least two dozen more Liberal Democrats headed by Joe Swinson. And nothing was more unthinkable to me than helping that to happen. So I did it for strategic reasons. I, all I can say to people in the seats where we haven't got Brexit Party candidates is for God's sake, don't vote Lib Dem or Labour. If you can bring yourself to vote Conservative or, or, or other independent candidates, then you must. Personally, I feel I, feel I can't vote because... I did everything to try and build a Leave Alliance. Some of you may have heard of this over the months. From the end of August, I tried to put together a Leave Alliance between us, some Labour figures who were keen to be involved, and the Conservatives. And I wanted all of us, in order to get this properly over the line with a clean Brexit, I wanted all of us to put country before party. It seemed to me to be the moment at which we should do something like that. And I'm afraid, despite all my efforts, all my urgings, all my generous gestures, all my pleadings, the Conservatives have studiously decided that it's not a leave majority they want. They'd even risk not getting a leave majority. All they care about is a Conservative majority. And they're thinking in that tribal party mindset. And it's why, once we do get Brexit, we need fundamental change and reform of our, voter, of our voting system, of the postal voting system that is so open to fraud, and the system of patronages and peerages where all their friends get put into the House of Lords. It's out of date. It needs reforming. We're the only ones that want to change beyond Brexit politics for good. Thank you. OK, now before we wrap up, I'd just like to add that as I started today's speech with this, and that is that every single one of you can make a difference still in this final push for votes by helping your local candidate, um, whoever they are, you know, every step, every leaf, every handshake, every conversation can make the difference. In many of these seats, we're going to be looking at slim margins. Where I was, it was decided by 441 votes in 2017. It's going to be, I think, even less this time. And so we can see that every final push could really help to change history, to get Brexit Party MPs elected and to really, really hold Boris to account and make a difference. Look, you've been a wonderful audience today. I hope it's been worth you coming along on this fine day. I was like saying, what's that yellow thing in the sky? For two weeks, we didn't see it up here when we were up to our elbows in water. So it's great that you've all come out. Now, before we go, you've all got a sign on your chairs. Can we do the usual Brexit party cheer? Take one of these. 
And let's all hold them in the air. One final cheer before the general election. What do we want? <laughs> when do we want it? Now. What do we want? Or when do we want it? Now. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.